Hi, this is Kevin. Welcome back to uh, part two of uh, my lecture on chapter six uh, from the Schwabi Project Management uh, book. So um, here we're going to talk about risk registers. And let's just take a peek ahead at, and we'll see a document here um, that's a risk register i guess this is a partially filled in one for uh the sample project from the book but it's just a spreadsheet so we've got uh, an id number a rank the risk the description the category the root cause the triggers potential responses the risk owner the probability the impact the status okay and and i'll go back to the slide before in which we talk around uh some of the uh components but the idea here is that this is a document that uh that the project team would create okay and then maintain over the life of the project so for instance uh the probability might uh, change over time uh the ranking would definitely uh, uh change and uh there's a lot of teams that um on a regular basis will will talk about maybe their top 10 or uh something like that okay so let's go back and see so um so we have an id number a, a rank usually a uh, high medium or low the name of the risk event a description a category under which it falls the root cause the real or underlying reason a problem occurs the triggers indicators or, yeah, or uh, symptoms of actual risk events. How do we know whether this has actually come to pass? Potential responses for each risk event, the risk owner, the person who's going to take responsibility for it, the probability that it's going to occur, the impact if it does uh, occur in its current status. Okay, this can drive a lot of good thinking and talking on a, a project. Um, it, this is some new material that PMIs uh, brought in, risk-related uh, contract uh, decisions. Work done by outside suppliers or sellers should be well-documented contracts, which are mutually binding agreements that obligate the seller to provide the specified products or services and obligate the buyer to pay for them. Project managers should include clauses in contracts to help manage project risk by using incentive or penalty clauses, certain types of contracts, such as fixed price uh, contracts to do the risk of incurring incurring higher costs than expected competition competition for supplying goods and service to help reduce the negative risk uh, and, and to enhance uh, the positives now in most organization project managers do not negotiate contracts and uh, for instance, if you work for a really large organization, there might be people whose whole job it is to negotiate co uh, contracts for the organization. I would say that traditionally the best that a project manager can hope for is to be in the conversation with whoever is negotiating the contract. Um, and one very important point is uh, once the contract is negotiated, the contract, the, the project manager should have a copy of it. I taught a project management course at a Fortune 500 uh, company in the Chicago area who will remain nameless. And I, I had 
30 people in the class who were actively uh, managing uh, projects for this uh, big uh, company. And I asked for a show of hands, uh, who has a project that has, as part of it, a contract with a vendor? And about half the hands went up. And I said, okay, of you, how many people have a copy of that contract? And only uh, if, if we had maybe 15 hands up, we had fewer than five who actually had a copy of the contract. How can you manage the risks associated with the contract if the people who negotiated it and signed it have, haven't even given you a copy of it? So um, the slide here would, would imply that as a project manager, you're negotiating uh, contracts. And the reality is uh, you're trying to have influence uh, over them and uh, input into them. And then uh, you need copies of them. Um, sample guidelines for risk-related uh, contractual agreements. Um, okay, this is worth a read. This is from the case from the book. Uh, project procurement management. So project procurement management. So we're on, <laughs> we've, We've done a segue from risk to procurement, and we just did a kind of a shoulder topic, which is risk in procurement, okay? But now we're on more fully to procurement. Uh, project procurement management includes acquiring or pro procuring goods and services for a project from outside the organization. As the business world continues to become more competitive and global, more and more projects include procurement, often referred to as outsourcing. Key outputs include procurement management plans, procurement strategy, bid documents, procurement statements of work, source selection criteria, make or buy uh, decisions, independent cost estimates, change requests, project document updates, and organizational process assets updates. Okay, make or buy analysis. Okay, so there's a financial analysis that one can do to decide whether it makes more sense for your organization to make something yourself or to buy it from the outside. Okay, and how would you do this? Well, we've already talked about how, how to do financial analysis of alternative uh, projects in this uh, course. You, you look at um, what the cash flows would be of two alternative scenarios. So how much, uh, how much revenue would you be getting in under uh, scenario A and what would the cost be in which of the time periods? And you use net present value analysis to figure out what what's the net present value of scenario A. That's maybe make it yourself. And then you do that for scenario B, which would be buy it from somebody else. Okay. And then you look at which has the more positive net present value and all other things being equal, that's what you would uh, decide to do. Now, even though they call this make or buy analysis in the book, the example is buy or lease. Okay, and it's the same kind of thing though, okay? Whenever you've got two scenarios, you want to estimate the cash flows, the inflows and the outflows over some relevant period of time, say five years or something like that. And you calculate them for scenario A and you calculate them for scenario B and you apply net present value uh, calculations and all other things being equal, you, you pick the one that has the more favorable or higher net present value. 
Okay. And when I say higher net present value, that's where you count the res the revenues that are coming in as being uh, positive and the costs that are going out as being negative. Right? Um, and when you're talking about buy or lease, okay, um, you can see if you analyze this over time that the buy scenario and the lease uh, scenario have some kind of a crossover point, okay, uh, where you can say, hmm, I would do better have bought this if I keep it for at least mm, 30 days, okay, and this, this kind of uh, comparison uh, can be helpful. And this is the data on which those things were based. I'll leave that for you to read. Okay, so um, there, there's a procurement and there's a procurement, right? So most of us who work for large organizations, like I work for the University of Illinois, and there are a lot of things that I need to do my job uh, or that I would need for a project that the university buys all the time, okay? And um, I just have to ask for it and it gets uh, charged to, to my uh, project, okay? It's not, uh, it, it doesn't take that much, okay? The university has a lot of red tape, but you fill out some forms and, and you get the stuff. Okay, and where do they buy it from? Well, they buy it from their normal suppliers, right? Now, uh, there are other things that a project has to buy that are not like your usual stuff. It's not pens and pencils and this and that. It's, it's like uh, big, unique things that, that a formal procurement process has to be done on, okay? So, um, if we have any of that kind of stuff, then we definitely need a procurement management plan. So it's a document that describes how the procurement process will be managed from developing a documentation for making outside uh, purchases or acquisitions to contract closure. Some projects must follow government uh, directive, such as the federal acquisition regulation known as FAR, which provides uniform uh, policies for acquisition of supplies and services for executive agencies in the U.S. And the same is true for state and local uh, government. Okay, so quite often you don't have to imagine what kind of processes you would follow. You just have to discover what they need to be. Um, when you're buying stuff from the outside, uh, you don't always uh, buy them with the same kind of contract. So the kind of contract that you might have might be any, uh, or any of or a combination of the following. A fixed price or lump sum uh, contract, a cost reimbursable uh, contract, a time and materials uh, contract, or an indefinite it delivery indefinite quantity uh, contract. So fixed price or lump sum uh, contracts involve a fixed total price for a well-defined uh, product or service. They're sometimes problematic when people are uh, talking about, say, custom software development uh, contracts because it's very hard for them to be well defined. Cost reimbursable contracts involve a payment to the seller for a direct and indirect actual costs. Time and materials uh, contracts are a hybrid of both fixed price and cost reimbursable contracts. Uh, what uh, there's another one here that I missed because it wasn't in bold unit pricing um, uh, contracts. Uh, these require a buyer to pay a supplier a predetermined amount per unit of service. Um, 
we would pay uh, $25 per uh, insurance claim. Indefinite it delivery indefinite quantity contracts provide for an indefinite quantity of goods or services for a fixed uh, time with a stated upper and lower limit. Presumably, um, presumably, the the quantity can change. Uh, so the amount would change, the amount paid would change, but only provided that it happened within the period of time specified in the range of uh, uh, quantity specified. Uh, so uh, contract type and incentive can be extremely effective. This is a story that relates both to risk and, and to contracting. Um, in Minneapolis in 2007, they lost a, a very key uh, bridge. And there was a very big uh, cost to people not being able to use the bridge in terms of uh, gasoline burned, air pollution created, and all those kinds of things. Now, what they did is that they created a, a contract with the vendor who built the new bridge such that they had an incentive to finish it early uh, in which they, in essence, were, were sharing the savings that the people were going to have. I mean, the people in general uh, had all these negative uh, costs while while the bridge was out. And so the society was going to have a savings if that bridge got done earlier. So they created an incentive for the vendor to finish early. And they did finish early and got a substantial uh, uh, fee, $25 million, uh, for finishing it early. Uh, but the savings to society were greater than that. So I think that's a, a really great story. Uh, here's a sample procurement management plan. Uh, it's for this just-in-time training project. They did really buy some substantial things from the outside. So they have the guidelines on types of contracts, standard procurement document or templates, guidelines for creating procurement documents, roles and responsibilities. Now, when you're doing these kinds of procurements, there are some terms that are used a lot that if you're not part of this kind of activity, um, they're important for you to learn. Um, there are RFIs, there are RFPs, there are RFQs. Okay, and they're used for different things. So what's an RFI? An RFI is a request for information. It's used when more information about the goods and services is needed. Potential suppliers are asked to provide the information before the buyer would send out an RFP or an RFQ. So it's a preliminary process. An RFP is a document used to solicit proposals from prospective suppliers. A proposal is a document which sellers describe what they will do to meet the requirements of the buyers. So a proposal, which is a response to an RFP, not only includes a price, but an approach. Okay, so not all vendors who submit a proposal in response to an RFP are expected to have the same approach. They're, they're thought that they'll probably be different in some significant respects. And that's one of the things that we're going to evaluate. Uh, whereas an RFQ, a request for quote, is a document used to solicit quotes or bids from prospective suppliers um, on standard items 
like uh, 20 metric tons of rock salt that delivered uh, in, along the Chicago River in December 2024. Very specific things for very, uh, the kind of thing you can just quote a price for. Here's some stuff from an RFP. Um, this is from the Global Construction RFP. Uh, I've read a lot of RFPs in my day for software development projects, and I've written or supervised the writing of uh, proposals. Uh, I've seen RFPs that are well more than 100 pages long. Okay, and I've written proposals that were well more than 100 pages long. So uh, this is pretty brief, but it's a pretty small project. Um, another term that comes up a lot in this contracting process is statement of work, SOW. So a a procurement statement of work or SOW is the description of the work that is to be purchased. It's a type of scope statement that describes the work in sufficient detail to allow prospective suppliers to determine if they are capable of providing the goods and services required at and an appropriate price. It should be clear, concise, and complete as possible describe all services required and include performance information such as the location and the timing of the work. This is a typically um, part of the RFP, the request for a proposal, and it is uh, typically relied upon when, um, when the vendor writes their uh, proposal. And in fact, uh, most uh, vendors will include a copy of a statement of work in their proposal as one of the assumptions upon which the proposal was predicated. So here's a contract statement of work for the just-in-time training project. I'll leave you to read that on your own. Uh, source selection criteria in the supplier evaluation matrix. So after doing a thorough, a thorough evaluation, evaluation of potential suppliers, many organizations summarize evaluations using a supplier evaluation matrix, a type of weighting scoring model. Suppliers are often evaluated on criteria related to cost, quality, technology, past performance, and management. So um, as a uh, supplier, these kind of schemes are uh, good, OK? And I'll tell you why. Uh, because um, uh, if you are a qualified supplier, uh, you have more to offer other than cost. So if if the the buyer was only evaluating responses on cost, then the weighting for cost would be a hundred percent. Okay. So if you're a capable vendor, you want them to also consider your past performance your educational background. This might be the educational background of the staff that you propose for the uh, uh, project. This could be some kind of a proxy for staff quality. And your your management uh, approach. Again, every proposal has an approach. OK, and so what what organizations uh, typically do is is they give the uh, proposals out to people who are part of the evaluation team and they ask them to score the vendors on the basis of these uh, things 
and they give them scores from one to 100 and they have a weighted average and they will award the contract that to the vendor who has the highest weighted average. Okay, so as a as a credible supplier, you certainly want them to consider much more than price. And as responsible buyer, you also want to consider much more than just uh, price. Okay, now we're going to shift and talk about change management. Okay, so um, projects represent a change in the operations of the organizations for which they are uh, completed. Okay, because we have uh, projects and we have uh, continuing operations and what we normally do is we, we have a team that creates some projects and then they hand that over, whatever the output is, a product, a service, a way of doing things over to whoever's responsible for continuing operations. And when it's implemented, that's change, okay? And it's important to be able to manage that so that it goes as well as we hope it to be. So change management focuses on the impact of projects and programs on people and organizations. In fact, some projects include a change manager on the project team. There are several approaches uh, or models of how change management works and the ones that we're going to talk about a little bit here are um, the PMI managing change in organizations practice guide uh, Jeffrey Hyatt um, uh, published Adcar a, a model for change in business government in our uh, community and Cotter developed an eight-step process for leading change. And Virginia Satir created the Virginia Satir change process model. And William and Susan Bridges developed the Bridges transition model. So these are all people who uh, profess to be careful thinkers about uh, change in organizations. So uh, here are uh, some details on the ADCAR uh, model. Um, and the implication here is that uh, people go through phases, uh, kind of like the phases of grief in a certain way, uh, we talk about a model for grief, right? And we have awareness, desire, knowledge, ability, reinforcement. In uh, Cotter's eight-step uh, process, what are the eight steps? One, create a sense of urgency. Two, build a guiding coalition. Three, form a strategic vision and initiatives, four, enlist and volunteer army, five, enable action by removing barriers, six, generate short-term wins, seven, sustain acceleration, eight, institute uh, change. Again, the idea in these things is that change doesn't just happen. We just don't take whatever we've created as part of the project and dump it on the organization and expect it to be successful. This has to be thoughtful and it has to be hands-on. Virginia Satir's change model. Uh, one, late status quo. Everything is familiar or business as usual. And then two, a foreign element. A change occurs, it shifts the status quo. And then three, chaos. People are in unfamiliar territory, making them feel uncomfortable. Well, I think we've all experienced that. Four, we have the transforming idea. People come up with ideas to find a way out of the chaos. Five, practice and integration. 
people try out new ideas, learning what works and what, what doesn't. Six, new status quo. People get used to the new way of working, right? So this, um, what's uh, kind of interesting about the model here is it, it does a good job of describing the way this works, even if you don't mm, have a lot of hands-on intervention. This is a good uh, descriptive uh, model uh, for the way things would work or not work um, at, at various times if you just uh, dropped your change on the organization. And then the bridges transition model, uh, we have endings. Every it transition it begins with one, which is to say, if something's going to start, something else has to end. And then the neutral zone, the second hurdle, a seemingly unproductive timeout when we feel disconnected from people and things in the past and emotionally unconnected to the president. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a tough place. And then we have the new beginning. We come to beginnings only at the end when we launch the new activities. I think uh, one thing that's good about this one, and, and is I think sort of e equally good about the the uh, satire one, is that they both emphasize how hard this middle time is, right? Because we've had the disruption, we've had the pain, but we haven't gotten, we haven't really gotten the benefits yet. Yeah, and maybe we don't understand what they are in any kind of a tangible way. These middle times can be very painful. Applying project management principles to change management and planning projects. Um, so we need to build thoughtfulness about this into our project uh, uh, plans and execution. Uh, create a collaborative project team environment, focus on creating value, build quality into processes and uh, deliverables, which I think we're saying don't make things unnecessarily disruptive. Navigate complexity, optimize risk responses, enable change to achieve the envisioned future state. Wait, so I, I would kind of bottom line uh, this to say, uh, don't make it worse. You know, this change is gonna be hard even if we do this very well. So let's do it very well and very thoughtfully because uh, change is always uh, painful. So let's not make it worse. Uh, so what about a hybrid, uh, what about an agile or hybrid, hybrid uh, project? Well, before I talk about this, I just want to emphasize that there's nothing that says that all these things that we talked about, even, they, even though they've come out of the PMI traditional project management curriculum, there's nothing that says that we can't think about them if we're doing an agile uh, project. Good agile teams are thoughtful. And if there's some aspect of all the things we just uh, talked about to apply to an agile uh, project, good agile people are gonna find a way to bring them to bear on the project, okay? So what are we saying here? Agile or hybrid teams can use any of the predictive project planning processes, tools or taxi techniques mentioned earlier. Well. Uh, the author agrees. Uh, for example, the sample project included surveys and course evaluations for employees that could use similar uh, metrics for the GCHC project. The following section focuses on planning approaches more specific to Agile teams. Okay, let's do that. So, Agile teams, when talk about quality, they talk about the definition of done. What does done mean to our team on our uh, project? 
It's a list of criteria which must be met before a product increment off, or a use, off in a user story is considered done. Another thing that they talk about as a measure of uh, done is shippable. Okay, and here's how I kind of uh, describe this. When you're on an, an Agile project, okay, and let's say on Friday, uh, you mark something as done, okay? And then over the weekend, you get sick and you're out for a week. And then you come in a week later and you're talking to people and they say, oh, you know, we shipped that stuff. We gave it to the client. You should not be, you should not say, oh my God, that wasn't done yet. You can't ship that. The, you know, that was... That was just the pretend version. No, 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 no. If you're if you say it's done, you mean you're willing to give it to the client and have them evaluate it. Okay, so that's what we mean by done. Typically shippable. They also talk about big visible charts that they call information radiators, the generic term for any of a number of handwritten or drawn printed electronic displays the team places in a highly visible location so that all the team members as well as uh, pastors uh, by can see the latest, latest information at a glance. So traditionally the Agile people are talking about a small team, about five people, uh, in a single room, all uh, together, co-located. Now, as uh, times have changed, and uh, of course we had the pandemic, and a lot of people work from home, um, information radiators that we put onto flip charts and whiteboards, I mean, they may be in the office and nobody's there. So I'm thinking that in more recent years, say the past uh, uh, four, uh, I think we need to find information radiators that are electronic. And here's some sample information radiators. We have a burn down chart a burn up chart, a combined burn chart, and then we have, this looks like a risk analysis. Okay, these are things that you could, um, you know, you could share with the class. Um, definition of done. Okay. Here's a team that actually uh, made up a list so that they were all agreeing on what they meant by uh, done. Okay, how might resource planning be different for Agile? Um, instead of having a project manager assign people to tasks, Agile teams self-manage, meaning they decide who will work on tasks themselves. Hmm. I think there's a lot of agile teams in which somebody takes a leadership role and they may call that person the scrum master and um, I'm sure they talk it out amongst the teams but the, there's there's a lot of agile talk that there's no manager there's nobody telling people what to do. And I, I think it's admirable that we talk about self-managing uh, teams and having teams collectively take responsibility. But the fact is that the way groups work, some individual or individuals tend to start to facilitate or lead. And that I think is a natural process. The team should have all the skills and authority to complete the work in the product backlog. This makes selecting the team important. Creating resource histograms and cross-training employees can help Agile organizations ensure they have adequate and skilled workers. Again, the, the Agile assumptions include a dedicated staff. So uh, 
the people who were going to be on that Agile team are uh, dedicated, at least in theory, to that work and only that work for the duration. Agile communications programming, well, um, we know from uh, both the Schwalbe book and in our course where, where we're doing the uh, uh, the late book that there are some good uh, diagrams that show all the communications that go on within Scrum and that includes uh, some Scrum planning and then we have sprints and within them we have sprint uh, planning and every day we have a daily Scrum and at the end we have a sprint review and after that we have a sprint retrospective. Okay, so those are pretty, um, I think the one of the nice things about this whole scrum meeting communication plan is that people seem to like it. It seems to work pretty much. Uh, you know, do various teams do slightly different versions of it? Yeah, they probably do. But in the main, this this is very popular stuff. Uh, Agile stakeholder planning. So the sprint review meetings allow key stakeholders to inspect the outcomes of each sprint and determine future ad adaptations. I just want to point out that I don't think it works well when the sprint review meeting is the first time that the key uh, that stakeholders have seen these uh, deliverables. I, it might be some of the key people who come to it, this might be the first time that they've seen it, but I, I think we will have reviewed it with other stakeholder representatives ahead of time. I don't think we want to get to a sprint review and have a big surprise. The Scrum Master or Project Manager works with appropriate uh, people to remove impediments. Um, that's the idea of the Scrum Master as servant leader. Key stakeholders determine the definition of done for each increment. And information radiators provide visibility and work progress for all interested stakeholders. Agile risk planning, emphasizing value to the customer, prioritizing work and collaborating as a team focused on one smart goal at a time helps suggest potential risk. So when we're deciding upon what work we want to bring forward into the current sprint, um, minimizing risks ought to be one of the things that we uh, consider. Another thing that gets talked about a lot is maximizing value, right? Uh, but minimizing risk is something that we ought to include as well. Teams should openly discuss impediments as part of their daily Scrum meetings and the Scrum master or project manager should work hard to remove impediments uh, so that people can get their work done. Many Agile teams use risk registers as uh, described earlier in the chapter. Agile procurement planning, okay. This is kind of interesting because it, because of the fact that we're agreeing upon this thing as we go, a lot of a lot of the planning for agile projects projects is kind of fluid it does make it hard to contract for it with an outside team and this agile procurement planning is um it is i i i think a serious effort to address those issues so for some projects a master agreement could be used for an overall a contract a master agreement allows for some work to be added in an appendix or supplement amount, allowing changes to occur without impacting the overall contract. Some organizations have streamlined the procurement process by using lean agile procurement, an agile approach for procurements where collaboration between people is a key success factor. 
Goals of leading agile procurement include reducing preparation efforts, working faster, simplifying paperwork, and evaluating hard and soft skills of potential uh, partners and preparing agile uh, contracts. Um, so if you really listen to what the agile people say, they say that what's been wrong with waterfall is it's too much like contracting, okay? And the really hardcore agile people would probably say, the only kind of real way to contract at, at agile work is to do it on a time and expenses kind, kind of basis, okay? So you're not, uh, the contract says, uh, um, the buyer's going to hire the vendor, the vendor's going to work on this a sprint at a time, and if it's not going well, the buyer's going to fire the vendor. Okay, but, they, but uh, the contract load on this is really lightweight. These efforts that we're talking about here, this lean agile uh, procurement, this is an attempt to bring contracting back into agile. And um, it's a little bit of a contradiction in terms, but there's a lot of organizations that want to have their cake and eat it too. Like they want to have the benefits of an agile approach and, and some contractual controls and guarantees. That's what they're trying to do with this. Would this appeal to... Uh, the most hardcore of the Agile folks, I don't believe it would, but it's going to appeal to some people or we wouldn't be talk about, uh, uh, talking about it in the text. Um, there's some good uh, talk in the book and here about a Lean Agile a procurement. Um, and... Let's uh, talk about what the goals are. Reduce preparation efforts. Uh, improve time to market. Simplify uh, proposals. Evaluate soft and hard skills. Uh, prepare an agile uh, contract. And, and we have an example here of this uh, Swiss uh, casinos uh, group. And I'm just going to say again that I think that truly hardcore agile people would think that this is heresy <laughs> okay uh but uh there are clearly people who are trying to do this and uh claiming success and i think we ought to listen to what they say um Sample agile slash hybrid procurement planning, um, instead of using a traditional request for proposal process, the plan, they uh, planned, oh, so we're talking about what went on in, in this uh, sample uh, project. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to let you read this. And then we come to the chapter summary. So uh, we're done here. Okay. So um, the, the stuff that we said about Agile projects, I think pretty much applies to all Agile projects. Uh, the stuff that we talked about with in the, earlier in the chapter, uh, there are a lot of things that we can bring to bear on the planning of a project. Uh, if we were doing a really large uh, project like a, Oh, the mission to Mars, for instance. Uh, we might use all of the things that we talked about in the, the in the chapter, and if we're doing a small project, we might use only a few. Okay, but uh, keep them in mind because, uh, in my experience, they're valuable, and um, they're the kind of things that you want to keep in your uh, bag of tools, and. Uh, bring them out when appropriate. So having said that, I'm going to wrap up and I'll say bye until next time. Bye-bye.